Hey, everybody. <clears throat> it's Tracy. How are you? Sorry for the uh, slight delay there. It is entirely possible that I had popped out and tried to get a glass of water while Brittany was uh, giving you all the startup information. I want to say thank you for coming uh, and welcome to uh, this, what is uh, probably <laughs> going to be a short-ish uh, webinar, Planning a Cloud Migration, which, you know, if we're talking about planning and architecting a cloud, that may seem uh, a little bit counterintuitive that it's going to be relatively short. But in large part, that has a lot to do with, you know, how much there actually is to do. We, we can't, unfortunately, walk through uh, the entire process of planning a cloud migration uh, in a webinar. But what I really want to do with this, and what I was kind of thinking about when I came up with this is, you know, really looking at saying, okay, what, what are the big ticket items? What are the things that, you know, if you're going in and, and you're going to be <clears throat> migrating workload into the cloud, uh, what are the things people miss? And, you know, at the highest level, what are the things, uh, maybe not what people miss so much, but the things you really want to think about. What are, you know, what from what I've seen, uh, what are really the most important concepts, all right? And that's really where we're going with this. And so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in and talk about what we're going to talk about. So the agenda for this, uh, there's, what, six things on the agenda. And we're going to talk about the migration process. And uh, that's probably not going to be exactly what you might think uh, as far as the process, because I'm not so worried about the how uh, as I am the why, right? Or maybe I'm not so worried about the what as I am the why, right? So what do you go through big picture project level as far as the uh, migration process? And then what is to me, <clears throat> and I say this as someone who's not a networking person, so this kind of breaks my heart, but what I've seen to be typically the biggest area of consideration when you are migrating workloads into the cloud, and in my case, of course, it's going to be Azure, and that's some of the networking considerations. Uh, we'll also talk about cost considerations, uh, which when it comes down to it is, is typically the most important consideration when you're moving to the cloud and depending on how you define that. Uh, also want to talk about administrative considerations. And, you know, that's one of those things where I, and I've seen this since I started in the cloud uh, roughly a decade ago, is this, this real apprehension about, okay, how are we going to manage things? How are we going to administer things in the cloud? And it's a reasonable thing to be concerned about, although uh, it's, it's, I think, in most cases going to be uh, a, a small issue. All right. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit, mostly I'll just list migration tools, not surprisingly, uh, there are quite a number of tools out there. What's interesting is that typically the best rated tools for migrations are the free tools that are part of the actual uh, cloud providers suite of tools. Not probably that surprising that they want to make really good migration tools. All right, and then what I'm going to do is demonstrate some of the Azure migration tools. And I'm going to look at really spend some time looking at the cost costing tools. Uh, and then I'm also going to look at something called an Azure Migration Project. So uh, I know, you know, watching a bunch of slides isn't necessarily super exciting when we're talking about a uh, webinar. So I will get through this, but I think it's important stuff to get through before we go in and, and have some fun with a demonstration. All right. So uh, this is one of those, uh, you know, if you ever go to any project management uh, course, uh, you'll you'll see this. and and I'm watching my numbers to make sure nobody just immediately jumps off as soon as they see this uh, because it's, it's a little bit trite. But I also do think it's important. And uh, two things that I think are important to, to come out of this are, the first of all, the need to assess and plan. Okay? And one of the things you need to assess right out front is why. You know, why are you moving to Azure and what are your success metrics going to be when you move to Azure? Because what you're going to find and what happens uh, more times than not with migrations into Azure is that people get really excited. And when I say Azure, this is true of cloud in general. People get really excited and say, oh, man, we have this really fun toy. Let's just move everything over there. And then, you know, three months or six months down the road, they start looking at the cost metrics and figure out that, you know, they had a data center they'd already paid for and maybe some of the stuff shouldn't have moved. So, you know, you want to, as you 
think about migration, you really want to think about, okay, uh, what are the cost metrics here? What are my success metrics uh, in, in migrating? All right. Now, there's another, oops, let me erase that. Sorry about that. Uh, got ahead of myself because I see I practiced this. I wanted to make sure I was going to tell you the right things. Um, but then I forgot to close it. Uh, so this is what a lot of people see as migration into the cloud. You know, they've got workloads on premises. They've got probably a virtualized environment, whether it's VMware uh, or Hyper-V uh, or something else and say, OK, we're going to move over. And uh, we have this infrastructure as a service. Right. And so we're going to take our virtual machines that we have. And there's a term that you hear a lot, lift and shift. Right. And this has a lot of uh, it's very attractive because in many ways it's going to be the least cost transition. Right. You've already got virtual machines. You're just moving the virtual machines from one place to another. You know, much like if you were moving virtual machines, say, from, you know, in a WAN environment, one data center to another data center. So that's something that is, is really pretty well known and understood. But I'll make the argument that if that's the last place you go, you're really missing the true value of migrating to the cloud, right? And, and the next step in migration is to start to look at platform services that are available in the cloud. Now, I will tell you, I'm an Azure person, right? So I'm gonna think about this in terms of what's available from Azure, but the truth is, all of the cloud providers provide these things. They provide their own variations of them. But when it comes down to it, they're all kind of similar, right? Uh, so things like hosted databases on the Azure side, if, if you've got an, a SQL database, if you've got a MySQL database, a MariaDB, a Postgres SQL database, all of those can actually be run as hosted instances. So you're not responsible for the software configuration. And the way that you pay for it is a lot more granular with a lot more options. Okay, web apps, storage. Storage is one of the big things. Ironically, it's one of the first things that people look at and say, oh, cool, you know, we have this unlimited storage. Let's just push everything there. Uh, and then they look back and say, you know, uh, we just moved all the stuff out of our data center that we had already paid for. Uh, and now we're paying for it again. So uh, it is a very powerful and valuable capability, but also something, again, uh, that you always want to balance. Now, uh, kind of the end point when you're talking about a cloud migration is to look at getting cloud optimized, right? And so, you know, it starts out saying, okay, we've got these workloads that are on virtual machines, and we can just move those virtual machines pretty much as is into Azure. Right? And then say, okay, let's start moving some functionality, but really not re-engineering anything. Okay, we had a database, it was running, uh, maybe it was running in a Docker container on a virtual machine. Now we've got it running you know, at the, the PAS level. Uh, we've got it running in a hosted database environment. But now let's look at cloud optimizing. Let's look at re-engineering our applications so they can take advantage of things like serverless compute. And we can get, again, much more granular uh, billing uh, and really only pay for what we use rather than pay for capacity. And that's something I always look at when I'm looking at cloud is you're either paying for capacity or you're paying for consumption. And generally speaking, all other things being equal, you really want to look for solutions where you pay for consumption because then you know you're not paying for things that you're not using. All right. So that to me is the migration process, right? You go through the, the standard you know, project planning concept. And, and to me, a lot of times that's very similar to what you would do if you're looking at extending your wide area network to another data center, right? And so if you've done that, you've really gone through a lot of what you need to go through as far as uh, the Azure story goes. Now, uh, in the big picture, what are some of the things that uh, you really need to look at? And I've got this circle here and I'll, I'll even put a check mark by it. Uh, asset inventory is absolutely critical, you know, and one of the things that you're doing is, is you're, you're pulling apart uh, your network a little bit there, right? And if I'm pulling apart my network, it's probably uh, a good idea to understand what the dependencies are. And I don't know what the dependencies are unless I know what my assets are, right? Everybody's got that one server you know, that's sitting there that nobody touches because they're not sure what it does. But the last time it went out, you know, the business was down or whatever. 
those are things you really need to do. And that really goes to understanding uh, your integration requirements. And that's both internal integration and external integration, right? So how are your various servers interrelated? What are the dependencies there? Uh, what third-party software are you dependent upon? What external uh, application programming interfaces, APIs, or connections uh, are critical to uh, the success of your operations, right? Or really just they are important because if, if they're there, they're important, all right? And another thing to understand, and this is something that I think intuitively you will get, but not necessarily right at the front of a migration project is that in the end of the day, just about every migration is going to be hybrid. You still have a data center, you still bought it, right? It's unlikely that you're going to move everything out of your data center. And that goes into that assessment and planning, right? You know, what's in your data center, what needs to, or what is going to be most cost effective to stay in the data center versus what's going to be most cost effective to move into the cloud environment, or in the case of this, the Azure environment, all right? And as I said in the previous slide, plan beyond lift and shift, right? Think about, okay, you know, what could we do to maximize our investment? We've committed to going into the cloud, you know, whether it's greenfield applications that are designed specifically for cloud, uh, or uh, whether it's re-engineering existing systems so that they fit better in the cloud. And one thing to do that, or one thing to consider with that when you are going, and, and everything's a caveat, right, is you need to balance as you do cloud optimize, you need to balance the uh, absolute optimization versus platform dependency, right? And so, for example, uh, if I am going into Azure, I might consider uh, going into, uh, you know, certain functionality that is uh, specific uh, to Azure. And that might be fine, but, you know, if I optimize that and then we're switching clouds, then, you know, there's some re-engineering there. You know, on the other hand, if I look and say, hey, I want to build highly scalable applications and I want to build these in containers and, you know, we're already thinking about Kubernetes. Well, Kubernetes is supported everywhere, right? So, you know, not just think about beyond lift and shift, but also think about, uh, you know, portability versus absolute optimization, right? And, and that's not a one thing or another that is always better. It's just a consideration when you're looking at migrating workloads into the cloud, All right? Now, for me, and I will say this, because I am not a networking person, I'm gonna take that out again, is I, I think from what I've seen that networking tends to be the most important consideration, the thing you need to think about. And, and here's the thing, right? When you look at basic compute, always break basic compute, basic workload into three things. You've got your storage, you've got your compute, and you've got your networking. Okay, now in most cases, and certainly not all, but in most cases, that compute is going to be pretty portable, right? I've got the ability to run Windows, I've got the ability to run uh, Linux. Most Linuxes are already certified, and even if it's not certified, it will probably run anyways uh, in the cloud, in Azure specifically, right? So by and large, moving over at the operating system level and above is not uh, going to be a major sticking point. Again, there's always edge cases there, things that for whatever reason, uh, this particular functionality absolutely refuses to work in the cloud. I literally don't know of anything above the operating system other than certain limitations on the Windows operating system, ironically, um, that is explicitly not gonna work in the cloud, but I'm sure that you, know, you can go and do a search and find those things, all right? Um, storage is storage. Uh, and in fact, there's already tons of hybrid storage solutions out there. So you may well already be without being in the cloud. You may be in the cloud from a storage standpoint, uh, not to mention lots of storage options in any of the cloud providers. But the networking gets to be a little bit more interesting. And that's where I kind of want to go here, right? So if we look at this diagram, there's a couple things that are important. First of all, I've got an on-premises environment. And just because I work with a whole lot of networking people, uh, you know, if, if anyone ever asked, you notice I did put a couple switches in here, right? So I've, I've got the networking folks uh, actually represented, 
Okay, so I've got some servers over here. These are my servers over here. I've got some clients over here. And when everything's on-prem, it's all working well. Even if I've got this in different data centers, right, I'm controlling everything, you know, at the at least layer three networking and above, right, we're all good, right? And maybe we even have a public website that's out here, okay? Well, when we start to migrate these things, you know, and, and we start to say, okay, uh, we want to migrate some functionality into Azure. So let's say we take some of our servers and we pop them over in Azure. Great. We were able to move those servers, everything worked. But then, you know, we still have this need for those servers to be integrated with what's on premises. As I said, uh, whether it's simply clients that are sitting on premises or more likely that you, you know, you're not migrating your entire workload stack into the cloud all at once, uh, you're going to have at least in a transition period and probably for an ongoing period, you're going to have a hybrid situation. So you need to have good, secure, reliable communication. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. One is simple, it's universal. Uh, you can set up a VPN tunnel. Actually, back in March, I worked with a, a fantastic colleague of mine, Keith Bogart, I'll give him a shout out. Um, but you know, we actually did a webinar where we set up a hybrid solution that had an on-premises uh, network with a Cisco ASA machine, and we set that up and made it work with Azure. It's really relatively simple to do, okay? But you're not limited to VPN, uh, right? A VPN is going to create a tunnel over the public internet. Uh, there's also Express Route, uh, which is going to go over private circuits and allow you to communicate between uh, your on-prem and your Azure environment. And uh, then you also may have a combination of both, right? Now, of course, everything you put in there, you're paying for. So uh, you're obviously going to, you know, be cognizant of that while you're developing. Now, I will tell you, setting up the connections is relatively easy. I will also tell you that Azure uses BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, uh, as it's, uh, and I, I'm not a network person, so I'm not going to use the exact right terminology here, but basically to automatically send routes between what's on premises and what's in Azure. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, where I think a lot of the work's going to come is setting up your route tables, making sure that routing is being handled appropriately between what's on premises and what's in Azure. Right. Uh, then you also have things though, like, okay, let's say we are uh, moving that website, right? Well, how are we going to handle that? You know, we have this, this website over here now, and I am doing a fantastic job of managing my environment here. Okay. There, all I wanted to do was draw around the website. Okay, so we have this public website still. What are we, what are we gonna do with it? You know, is it www.ine.com? Okay, that's gonna probably be fairly easy, but just being aware of the fact that, you know, at, at a minimum, you know, you're changing your public IP address, right? So if you had things that were going specifically to a public IP address that was being hosted on premises, now you're either going to have to look at updating those public IP addresses, updating firewalls that may need to access what's in Azure um, and, you know, or possibly setting up some kind of on-prem uh, reverse proxy. Although when you start going to that level, you know, it may be something that says, look, if we have to do this much for this one service, do we want to leave that one service on premises? And, you know, that's really why I put the public website in there. I, I think in most cases, a public website's probably going to have a DNS name, but those are decisions that you need to make on pretty much a case by case basis. You know, what, what is going to be the impact of moving this workload of moving this server uh, into the cloud? Hopefully it's going to be minimal, right? Uh, but that all goes down to uh, the way that you, uh, you know, the way that you've already architected, frankly, your on-premises environment. Um, and I tell you what, I've got a great question in the open questions, and I absolutely encourage you to ask questions. Uh, be more than happy to answer them. Uh, there's a great question in there now. I'm not going to ignore it because we're going to talk about it shortly. Okay. All right. Now, big picture. 
Uh, what are the networking considerations? First of all, overall networking architecture, just so you know, I'm gonna throw this one at you, almost always hub and spoke, right? And the idea with that is that I've got my on-prem environment, I've got an Azure virtual network, and I set up a gateway connection between these, whether it's VPN or express route, doesn't really matter, right? But I don't necessarily put my workloads in there, I divvy out my workloads across different virtual networks. And those virtual networks may be regional, they may be in different regions. They may be hosting different workloads, whatever I need to do, it's hub and spoke. And I'm not saying that's the only architecture that you'll ever use, but it is by far the most common and probably should be the starting point of any network architecture that you design over on the Azure side. And I will tell you, uh, as far as complexity of networking, you know, if we've got anyone here from our uh, Cisco training side, first of all, thank you for coming over and, and viewing something on the cloud. Uh, but also, you know, one of the things that I find whenever I'm talking with our Cisco instructors and they pull up uh, one of their baseline uh, architectures, one of their baseline uh, device architectures, routing device architectures, I just, my head spins uh, because I'm like, wow, that's really complicated. Necessary, I understand it, I'm, I, I'm, but it's just like, wow, I wouldn't want to necessarily have to come up with that. And that's one thing you do want to, stand want to understand architecturally is that, you know, you're not designing the physical layer, right? This is all virtualized and it's really very simple. So, hey, I want a virtual network, cool. What's my uh, IP address range for the virtual network and a few other things. And I've got control, but I'm not setting up physical routing uh, and, and redundancy and that kind of thing. Okay. Oh, and I need to connect to another network. Let me set up a connection real quick. Just set up peering. Okay. And so that's, you know, the things that you want to think about. Um, the biggest issue that I've seen uh, really across any kind of uh, migration is IP addressing, right? Um, defining your IP address space and what to do with hard IP address dependencies. And the answer is not really great on that last part, right? Now, again, how much pain you have in moving kind of depends uh, really in large part on A, uh, do you have hard-coded IP address dependencies that are going to be very difficult to update? Uh, and uh, B, um, if you do, uh, how much intermingling is there, right? So uh, really, if I want to think about that, let's say that, let me clear this out, just to, just to give you a quick, quick kind of idea of what's going on here. All right, so let's say I've got my on-prem environment. And let's say I've got a server here. And to make my life very simple, this server's at 10.0.0.50, okay? And I wanna move that server over into Azure. Now, if I move that server over into Azure and I don't have to care about its IP address, so maybe over in Azure, I set up a 10.1.0.4, .0 okay? Uh, if I can do that, this is easy and I've just wasted your time talking about it, right? But if I've got hard-coded dependencies on the 50, I've got two options. Now, I've actually read, and it's, it's not a supported architecture, but you actually can set up effectively a reverse internal reverse proxy uh, where you have a machine listening to 10.0.0.50, in this case, on your internal side, and it's going to route traffic uh, over to Azure, right? Or what you could say is, you know what? I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna put that, and this is gonna sound like, well, why are you making such a big deal of this? But there's a point. So let's say, you know what? I want that to be 10.1.0.50, okay? Now you can do that. The problem is when I set up this connection, I cannot have overlapping IP address ranges, okay? As far as Azure's concerned, as far as what gets advertised through BGP, okay? You know, if, if I've got over here 10.0 slash 16, I could not put over here uh, 10, excuse me, that was supposed to be 10.0. I 
There we go. I cannot put over, oh, so you know what? I'm just going to go 10.0.0 slash 24. Can't do that, right? What I could do is I could say, look, is everything on the 10.0.0 slash 24, can I move all of that, right? And so then instead of defining this over here as, you know, 10.16 prefix, maybe I've got a 10.0.1 slash 24, uh, et cetera, okay? Or maybe even, you know, I go up a little bit higher. But the point is, you know, if I do that, then I say, okay, cool, I've got my 10.0.0. I can move those over and still route everything. All right, and hopefully that makes sense. I will tell you static IP addresses that need to stay the same are going to be the biggest challenge and it's not an uncommon challenge. It's not an insurmountable challenge, but it is something if you know you have that in that, you know, assess and plan stage, then you're, you can plan for a process, you can plan for a solution or at least a workaround for that. Okay, uh, also uh, that's kind of the big thing here, less control of low level networking, right? Simple as that, you know, you're going down to the virtual network. You're not going down uh, really, uh, certainly internally, you're not going down below TCP. Uh, supported protocols right now on the Azure side are TCP, uh, UDP, and in now limited ICMP, okay? Uh, so, you know, your lower layer uh, protocols other than BGP, which is specifically for setting up gateways uh, in the Azure environment, you're not going to have access to those. So that is something to uh, consider as you move over. Also, bandwidth and throughput costs, right? If you've got a gateway, you are paying for the uh, capacity of that gateway. And there's various levels of capacity that you can pay for, simple as that. Also, every byte that goes outside of Azure, if it leaves Azure, if it egresses Azure, you're paying for that, okay? Doesn't matter how it goes. So that is something, that's one of those hidden costs. Oftentimes it's not a big deal uh, because ideally you don't have necessarily massively network heavy traffic, but if you do, and particularly if you're pulling massive amounts of network traffic from Azure, say into your on-prem, it's something to be aware of. Um, implementation of express route, um, there's more to it. Now, if you're going with express route, you're going to go with a third party provider. There are registered third party providers in every region. Express route is the uh, private circuit connection between your on premises environment and Azure. Tons of variations of that. Uh, another thing to consider and take a look at is the Azure Virtual WAN. Uh, this is actually set up to, frankly, simplify not only connecting your on-premises environment into Azure, but uh, that in addition to connecting multiple Azure uh, virtual networks and uh, possibly uh, geographically dispersed on-premises environments. So if you've got a data center in you know, different geographies, uh, if you have data centers in different geographies, then that's something you might want to take a look at is the Azure virtual WAN. All right. Now, big picture, uh, what are some of your cost considerations? Uh, yeah, I can't do anything short. I said this wasn't going to take long. I just looked at my watch. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not going to go through this too much because I think that uh, it is uh, hopefully fairly self-evident. These are all big categories, uh, you know, things that you're going to want to think about. Uh, but, you know, look, being uh, these all cost things, right? You, it's a project. You need training. Uh, you need testing. You're probably going to need consulting. And there is possibly, uh, and, and usually, I think it's safe to say, probably some downtime of something. Okay? Uh, ongoing costs, subscription costs, consumption costs. Uh, so, and that varies. So, subscription costs are usually capacity costs, uh, whereas uh, consumption costs are uh, well, basically consumption, okay? You may have licensing costs, right? And that's one thing that is really important to understand is that when you move into the cloud, you're not all of a sudden getting away from any licensing costs. Uh, you, you still have to pay for stuff. Now, the way you pay for it is probably gonna be different. Uh, it's gonna be a subscription-based payment as opposed to an upfront licensing payment, although you may already be on a licensing subscription environment, but that cost doesn't go away. You're not just getting something for free. Uh, and then also support costs, right? Now, you know, and again, these are all the costs I'm laying out. I'm not laying out the savings here, 
right? Because at the end of the day, there are significant savings. Uh, and, but, you know, these are all things that you, you want to think about. And I think sometimes when people say, hey, we're going to the cloud, they want to overlook these, right? And in the end, that's not successful. All right, so I've got a life cycle, overall life cycle, very high level, uh, overall life cycle cost comparison, you know, and really, if, if you kind of look at this, those first two lines are pretty much your trade-off. Now, there's, there's also trade-offs in a administrative costs, and we'll talk about that in a bit, okay? Uh, but, you know, you're saying, look, uh, we, our data center's full. Our choice is that we can invest millions of dollars in expanding or, uh, or acquiring a new data center, you know, or we can say, okay, we're going to shift over and we're just, we don't have to do this. Let's just throw things into the cloud, right? And then, uh, great, it's still going to cost, but it's just a different cost, right? And, and one thing with that, you know, and, and particularly one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about um, is uh, you've got uh, this, you know, it's certain things that are sometimes impractical uh, to implement in an on-premises uh, environment, okay? Uh, for example, uh, Azure uh, Key Vault, okay? Azure Key Vault uh, is a way of securely storing uh, information in Azure. Now, uh, you can, uh, without going to Azure Key Vault, right, you can uh, go ahead and you can set up your own uh, hardware-based uh, security, right? And if you are familiar uh, with hardware and you're familiar with setting that up, you know, you, you could potentially uh, set up, it could cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to set that up. Uh, Key Vault uses the same underlying technology, uh, but it's extremely cheap. Okay, you're not buying all of the hardware to set up your secure environment. Microsoft's already done that, it's already certified, and you're just riding on top of that. So, you know, again, these are not one-for-one -one comparisons. Okay, also, of course, very important. Just, just want to make sure we're all good with this. Never forget that cost. Important. All right, now, what else do we have here? Okay, some administrative considerations. So these are things that uh, you want to think about as you're migrating over into a cloud environment. Okay, what, and, and I put these kind of together. Okay, what proprietary tools, what administrative scripts do you have running? Now, administrative scripts that run at the OS level and above, those are probably going to be consistent. You're probably going to work with little to no and probably no modification. If I've got PowerShell scripts for configuring my uh, servers, those are probably still going to work when those servers are running in Azure. Okay, but what about things like, let's say, VMware automation, right? And I know that because I, I know the guy working on our side that's doing bunches of that, right? Well, you know, you may have this library of scripts that you use in VMware uh, to automate processes. Well, those aren't going to be applicable in Azure unless you set up the new Azure VMware service, but that's not really uh, probably typical. Okay, so those are just things that you need to think about. You know, what are your management and monitoring tools that you're using, right? You think about, you go into your NOC, your Network Operations Center, there's great big uh, pictures up, you know, big screen TV, so everybody feels really cool. Um, you know, what's, what's back in that? And is that going to work with your uh, cloud-based systems? Now, generally speaking, if anything that's agent-based has a high probability of working, right? Because you can just go and install that agent and as long as it's got a pathway by which it can communicate, as long as it's not communicating over some uh, really obscure uh, protocol that's not supported, then uh, you're going to be fine, right? Um, you know, if, if it's something else, you know, if you've got, you know, systems that tie, for example, I mentioned VMware, Hyper-V would be the same thing, you know, that tie in at a low level, then those are things you're going to have to consider what are, what are you going to replace that with. Uh, you know, your virtualization, uh, there are some limitations, although it's, it's fairly broad in terms of virtualization capabilities is very well documented. Uh, your networking, I've mentioned that before, and also, you know, business continuity. And really business continuity is almost always a net plus on the cloud side. Uh, you know, the, now the capabilities that are baked in, whether it is 
uh, for uh, disaster recovery uh, or for availability. Uh, you know, those, there's lots of that that's just built in that you basically click a button and you get in the cloud uh, as opposed to, you know, all the processes you've set up. But you have those processes already, you need to make sure you consider them uh, in the Azure environment as well. Okay. Now, I, I just want to do a real quick uh, drawing of this uh, just to kind of think about this, you know, if, if I think about the overall stack, and I use this stack diagram for so many different things, right? So let's say I'm on-premises, okay? Well, on-premises, I've got my hardware, I've got the BIOS above that, right? I, depending on whether I'm going bare metal, with my hypervisor, I've got a hypervisor. I'm gonna say hypervisor, not hyper-V, so I'm being agnostic here. Right, and then on top of that, for my workload, I've got OSs, I've got services, and I've got the workload, right? And, and you know, okay, what am I talking about? Let's say I'm running a, an API service uh, that is, is used by, uh, maybe it's an accounting service that's used throughout my organization. I've got an international organization, right? Uh, and I have to host that. Right, and so if I'm hosting that or I'm hosting a website, whatever it is, that's my workload, but there's all these things underneath of it, right? And on premises, really, you're responsible, you have tools that are uh, designed to manage all of these, right? In the cloud, guess what? We still have those same things, right? We still have hardware. There's still, you know, control software. There's still a hypervisor in case I can actually say Hyper-V because that's what it is here. There's still an OS, there's still services, and there's still a workload. But one of the things that's really useful uh, is uh, this dividing line that kind of divides the overall stack into two things. One is called the control plane. Okay. This is what's going to be controlling your system. And, you know, there's, there's an integration with it. There's a full API for it, but you're not controlling that, right? You may be configuring it, but Azure's taking care of everything below that control plane and giving you a way to interact with it, right? Above that, we have what we call the data plane. And, you know, an easy way to look at that is, and, and there's other ways to define it, but in this discussion, the data plane is all the stuff you're responsible for. Now, the line I have here would be for infrastructure as a service. Right? If I'm using platform as a service, that line goes up much higher, right? But administratively, you know, what that means, let's say you're using platform as a service, you're still going to have some knobs to turn, right? I mean, honestly, kind of all throughout here, but that's all going to be managed through the Azure Control Plane API. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to have to write code to do that. There's tons of tools that are built to do that, but it's quite possibly a different set of tools than you would use over here. And, you know, that's just, that's not a bad thing, but it is something that you want uh, to consider. Now, finally, the question, there was a question that was asked. Dependencies are critical. Are there tools you like to use to document uh, those requirements? So there are a lot of tools out there uh, that you can use with various uh, levels of integration uh, to track out your, uh, your dependencies. Okay, uh, you know, my, and again, this is being a Microsoft developer, uh, I, Absolutely love Application Insights, which happens to be an Azure product, but it works uh, through an API and it can do all sorts of things, including uh, mapping out dependencies, right? But there's tons of other tools out there. In terms of a tool that I would use just for that, uh, that would probably be it. But uh, the, the migration tools, there's many migration tools that can do the same thing. For example, uh, your Microsoft migration tools. Okay, there's something called a Microsoft migration project and depending on how you set that project up, it will actually document uh, application dependencies. Now, how does it do that? Okay, well, it's, you know, it can't magically go and, and know every kind of configuration file or anything else, but it's looking at traffic, right? It's analyzing traffic that's going through machines based on agents that are on the machines. Uh, and so 
you know, there's, there's tools for that. Now, I'm not an AWS person, but my understanding is they have the same thing and the same thing uh, with the uh, Google uh, Cloud platform uh, with their uh, Velostrata pro product, which is a great name. Uh, but in any case, so, um, you know, as far as dependency, if you're moving into Azure as part of your planning, uh, what I would do is really take a look at the migration project. And one reason for that is that it's free. Uh, it's free. It's tuned to moving into Azure. If you were moving into AWS, I'd probably make the recommendation. And one of the things that was interesting, I did kind of getting ready for this is I just did a quick survey going out there. Okay. You know, what do people say are the best tools? And across every review that I found, what I thought was interesting is that really the ones that typically were right at the top were the ones provided by the cloud providers themselves. So um, there are other tools out there, uh, ones that get a lot of, of great, um, ones that get a lot of, of great press uh, are these three. Uh, I can't honestly tell you anything about them because I've never used any of them. Uh, there's also solution, uh, solution specific. That wasn't that hard to say. Uh, so if you've got Carbonite and you've got Chef or any other system that might uh, have a hybrid component in your uh, really planning process, you want to take a look at that in your assessment process. You know, what tools do we already have that may in fact work not only in the migrated environment, but they may in fact help us to migrate. Chef advertises all over the place. And it kind of makes sense if you're familiar with the product uh, that they've got tooling to actually assist in the migration process. All right. Um, now, another question, and that is absolutely relevant. What is the difference between AWS, Google Cloud, and MS Azure? Okay. Great question. And here's what I'm going to say. I can remember how to go to whiteboard here. So just W, right? Hey, there we go. Learning how to use my... Uh, my tools. Okay, here's the idea of cloud. I've got some cloud provider. Okay, typically within the cloud, you have three levels of services. You have infrastructure as a service. And that's where the cloud provider is going to provide you the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, right? You can think of that as you're responsible for the OS and above. I don't know why I put a dash on OS, okay? So you've got virtual machines, virtual machines, virtual networks, virtual storage, okay? And that's what you get with infrastructure as a service. All of the physical stuff is handled for you. Platform as a service, you are responsible for the workload. Everything below the workload is being handled by the provider. Okay. And so by workload, that could be your web application. It could be a service that you're running. Okay. Uh, and then at the highest level, we have software as a service. That's where uh, the provider handles everything. All right. Common example of that that you may be familiar with, uh, the tool that you're watching this on right now. Uh, we're hosting uh, this through Zoom. Zoom is software as a service. We don't have Zoom servers sitting anywhere uh, under INE's control, right? We're relying on them. We use uh, the Google Documents, Google Drive. Uh, you may use Office 365, what is now Microsoft 365. Right, those are all software as a service. Now, that's not your question though, right? Your question is, what is the difference between Azure, AWS, and Google? Fundamentally, and this will probably get me some hate when somebody sees this on YouTube, fundamentally, nothing, okay? They're fundamentally all the same. Right, because all of them, and, and I've played around in oracles as well, right? all of them are gonna give you the ability to, to host your virtual machines in their environment. Uh, all of them are gonna have platform as a service. In Azure, it's called uh, Azure Function Applications. The same thing in AWS is called Lambda. Okay? And now, so conceptually, the, they are the same. What are the differences? Well, uh, features, Right, you know, so for example, the types of virtual machines, the sizes, the capacities that you have in Azure uh, are gonna be a little bit different uh, than what you have in AWS. It's gonna be a little different than what you have on Google Cloud Platform, okay? Uh, but, you know, again, the base concept is there. The way that you host 
uh, functionality in Azure at the platform as a service level will be a little bit different, right? In both cases, if, if I'm a .NET, now I'm kind of a .NET core developer, um, I can create my applications. I can literally put that application in any one of the providers, particularly because I'm leaning a lot towards containerization. And every one of the providers, for example, has a, their own managed Kubernetes environment, which if you may not have heard that name ever before, and that's fine. But what it means is I could literally build uh, a container in, on my machine that I'm, I'm giving this webinar off of, and I could deploy that container as is uh, to Azure or to AWS or to uh, the Google Cloud Platform. And I'm sure also to other IBM and, and uh, Oracle as well, right? So that's a great question and, and I love that you asked it and, and hopefully that makes sense that the answer is literally nothing. There is no difference. Okay, well, there's some differences, but fundamentally nothing. All right, now, finally, after I said that was gonna be short, I'm, I, probably uh, the intrepid Brittany laughed when I said that because she's at all of these and they're never short. Okay, what I wanna do briefly is I'm gonna go through uh, some resources that are available uh, for the planning and assessment phase and, and really also in many cases ongoing. Uh, I'm gonna look very briefly at the total cost of ownership calculator uh, which is a tool that Microsoft provides that not surprisingly uh, will typically tell you how much money you're going to save uh, over time by moving to Azure. Uh, there's a price calculator, which I actually think is a, uh, a more appropriate tool because it's just raw price. Um, and uh, that I'm going to show you that. And then there's also, and this is something I haven't really harped on too much. And it may be because uh, I, I care about this because uh, for some reason my Twitter feed is full of InfoSec people, but um, compliance, okay, security compliance, right? Uh, and, and how do you think about that and how do you put that right in the upfront part of design and of your migration? And then finally, I'm going to show you something kind of cool, the Azure Migration Project and just a very brief glimpse at what you can do with it. Uh, and uh, Emilio, uh, whose question is, can I access, uh, how can I access this recording? You joined late because of work. First of all, thank you very much for joining. And second of all, no problem. Uh, every one of these is recorded and uh, Brittany at the end is going to uh, let you know exactly how you can view the recording. If you're viewing the recording, you won't see that uh, because it typically gets cut off. Uh, but uh, stick around and uh, we'll give you uh, that information. Okay, let's go ahead and let's get started again. I'm gonna go through the first three pretty quickly. I just wanna show you that they're here, All right? And so the first one is the Azure Total Cost of Ownership Calculator, okay? And what this does, it says, okay, here are the workloads that you're gonna have, right? And pretty simple workloads. All right, and say, so, all right, I have a server workload. Well, what is it? Say so it's a Windows server. We've got some physical servers, our Windows Linux. Let's say it's a, let's say it's a Linux box. Uh, I've got 10 of these servers and I'm thinking about migrating. Uh, the uh, procedures, our processors per server, excuse me. Uh, by default, there's four. Uh, and by default, there's uh, four cores per processor. I'm just honestly making this up. All right, and uh, typically, these are a little bit smaller, it's 64 gig of RAM. I want to optimize this by CPU and they don't have a GPU, okay? And then I can add a server workload, another one, and define that out differently. But we'll just do that. Add a database, what type of database? Okay, so let's just go through. I'm just going to literally take all the defaults here. You can see that I've got the ability to change that. I am going to say, you know what, I want to move that uh, to a... Uh, SQL database. So that is what I want. Okay. And there we go. Storage. How much am I storing? Okay. Right now it's on a uh, SAN. Maybe we're running SSDs. And capacity that we've got is 100. Oops. 100. I will make this work. 100 uh, terabytes backup. Petabyte, okay, and let's say, we'll just say that. And archive is a petabyte. IOPS, uh, we don't know that, we'll leave that blank. 
And then outbound bandwidth, this is what I was talking about. You're going to be paying for that. We don't really necessarily anticipate a whole lot of networking bandwidth, so we'll go there. Okay, and then I can say, all right, what are uh, some of my assumptions? Well, I'm assuming uh, US dollars. I'm assuming that uh, I can move my licenses over. Uh, I'm not using geo-redundant storage. Okay. Uh, I'm using the coolest, most cost-effective virtual machines. Okay. I've got uh, my estimated electricity cost, estimated storage costs, IT labor, all kinds of other assumptions. I'm not going to go into them, right? But what it'll do and say, all right, there we go. Based on that, what do you know? I can save as much as $70,000 over five years. Okay. And uh, that's my cost. And then you can kind of break it out uh, into the cost. And I believe, yeah, uh, because I had so much cost, 92% of the cost over here is storage. And then it breaks out farther. And that's, that's really what this tool does. Okay, uh, next is the price calculator. This one uh, is, I think, in some ways a little more straightforward. I usually have an estimate that I've, I've got there that I've played around with. There we go. So look, let's say, hey, I know I'm gonna move over <coughs> this, uh, this workload. And the workload has a, a SQL database. I've got a, an API that I use. It has to be set up. Uh, on a Linux box because of certain requirements that it has. Uh, but then I also have a web application that uh, is pretty, pretty standard. Maybe it's a Node.js web application. So what I need, I need a virtual machine. We're going to put that over there. Uh, I need a SQL database and I need an app service. Okay, so those are three things I need. And then I can come down here and say, okay, I have some options here, right? So let's say, for example, I know that it's, it's Linux, just kind of fun because that cuts my price down significantly. All right, and uh, it's going to be, you know, uh, in East U.S. because that's where I put everything, which actually does impact the price. That's one thing you need to look at is the fact that the region will affect the price. Okay, how many machines do I need? What tier of functionality do I want? Let's see if we've got the Bs. There we go. We're going to go with a uh, B4 MLS 121, but decent performance. And let's save some money. I'm gonna go through your reserved. Then I say, okay, what disks do I have here? I wanna run this on a standard SSD, one disk. And I anticipate uh, 100, not 100 transactions, but that's 10,000 transactions. So my overall cost of that uh, is uh, $46 a month, right? And then I see my Azure SQL database uh, we've got various uh, things here. I'm going to move that to a DTU. And let's go standard. And again, the details of that, not that important. That's uh, $73 a month. Okay. And I can do other settings there. And then the app service, kind of the same thing. Uh, I want this over in East US. Where are we? All right, that's going to be running on... Linux, I need this standard S1, okay, and then anything else. So for that, it's going to be $189.18 per month. And obviously, uh, I can go in there and I can, I can uh, change those assumptions and get a, a more accurate cost estimate. Okay, this one, again, I've, I feel like I, I really want to get to the fun stuff. Uh, but I wanted to have this link in here as much as anything else. Uh, it is highly likely that you are uh, subject to various uh, uh, compliance requirements, regulatory compliance requirements. Uh, and what this does is it goes through and it talks about the different compliance uh, options or the capabilities. Uh, let's say, for example, if you're US and you've got FIPS, I can go in there and say, okay, uh, what can I use, what do I need to do to be FIPS compliant if I'm moving over to Azure, okay? And this is, this is really important, I feel, but it's also something that uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on right now because that's a pretty, pretty uh, deep hole to go down. But I do wanna show you is the Azure Migrate project, okay? Now, the Azure Migrate project, what this allows you to do is to really define tools that you wanna use and configure tools that you wanna use 
for two really critical phases of migration. There's the assessment of migration where you go into things like finding dependencies. Uh, and then there's also the actual migration itself. Now, I've already got this set up because it takes a while to get set up, but I'm going to show you some uh, pretty cool things. I'm using the Azure tools. Okay? And again, these are tools. If you go out there and you look at uh, comparative reviews, uh, you know, if you're going into a specific uh, cloud, whether it's Azure, AWS, or, or Google Cloud Platform, uh, or others, you know, look at their tools because A, they're going to be free, and B, they're uh, typically, again, the highest rated uh, that you'll find. Now, however, uh, there are actually multiple tools uh, that are integrated here. Uh, for example, Cloudomize, if you use that, mentioned, uh, Corrent, uh, SurePass, that was one of the, uh, another one of the highly related or highly rated ones. Uh, Turbonomic. Uh, these are a number of different tools that are actually, uh, you can automatically kind of integrate into a, a unified experience. Okay. And so those, those are all tools that you can use for uh, really assessing what's on premises. Okay. And there's links for all those. Uh, really, I think the takeaway is if you're using any of those already uh, for other purposes, then you most likely will be able to integrate that uh, directly into this overall Azure migrate process. It's got, your, you know, kind of a combined dashboard uh, environment. And then you also have migration tools. So the actual migration tools and uh, Carbonite migrate, uh, cur current, which uh, does both assessment and migration and uh, actually Rackware as well uh, can help with migration. So uh, these are tools now not listed there uh, are the Azure tools because I already pulled those in uh, and I have those set up. But you know, I can, I can really build a migration project uh, based on, on what is, is a reasonable uh, set of tools that either A, I can pull in that may be free like the Azure tools or that I may already be working with. Now, in terms of assessment, all right, and it's, it's laid out. One of the things I like about this is it's really laid out pretty straightforward. Uh, there's, there's really three processes, three parts to the process. Uh, there's discover, there's assess, and then there's see what's going on. Okay, that's, that's the technical term for overview. Now, in terms of discover, what I can do is I can go here and say, okay, uh, a couple ways I can discover. Uh, one, uh, I can go and say, okay, how am I going to discover? So uh, if I'm using VMware, uh, there's actually an appliance that you can install into VMware that's going to integrate with VMware uh, and get lots of information. I actually had plans on showing you that, but uh, we had a little bit of a glitch uh, yesterday in, in our uh, VMware system, so uh, I wasn't able to. Uh, but if you come over here, we're, first time, we are an hour in, first time I'm I'm trying to sell you on anything. Uh, actually, if you come over, if you're interested in IE training, uh, actually in, in several of the courses, I actually go through the process of setting up uh, the migration process for VMware. But in any case, uh, let's say I'm going with VMware, then what you do is you download an appliance. And you can download that as an OVA file uh, or a zip file, which is then uh, you would go through kind of a manual process of installing. Right? And then that's gonna give you an appliance and you configure that appliance uh, to perform discovery. And there's, there's a web interface for it. It's a very easy thing to set up outside the scope of this uh, course. But, but I'm going to ask you to take my word that it's a pretty easy process to set up. And it just sits there in the background. And, and I've actually done this for Hyper-V. Uh, you can also do it for physical or other. So let's say you want to uh, move AWS resources into Azure. Uh, you can also, if you've, you know, maybe you've got uh, tens of thousands of machines. You've already done inventory on them. Uh, you already have this information. There's a CSV format that you could take, push it into CSV, and just pull that file up uh, into the Azure environment. And if you don't know what that format is, you could actually download a sample CSV file. Okay, so that's the first part. Uh, you discover machines, right? And then uh, you'll notice here, hopefully you can see this okay. Maybe we'll uh, zoom in just a little bit. And it doesn't want to let me zoom in, probably because I was hitting the wrong button. There we go. All right, uh, so I actually already have three discovered servers. Okay, I've got uh, a, actually I'm running a Hyper-V machine in Azure right now. That's, that's my pseudo on-prem. It's got a couple of virtual machines uh, that it's, it's running within that. Okay, and uh, I installed the appliance, the virtual machine that, that's, you know, collecting this information. Okay, and what I can do is I can run assessments. 
Okay. And when I run assessments, there's two different types. Okay. So I've got Azure VM where there's now this Azure VMware solution, but we want Azure VM. All right. So my discovery source are the machines that were discovered with the appliance. All right. And I'm going to give this a name. It's called demo. Okay. And then assessment properties. So what do I want to assess? I'm going to make some changes here. Okay, because everything I do goes into East US, it's just how I am. All right, storage will take automatic. Uh, I want to allow this to use reserved instances. All right, I want performance-based. Either I can do on-premises or performance-based. We go one day of performance history, utilization, and VM series, say, DSV3, EV3, ESV3, and FS, there we go. So these are all just different types of VMs I'm okay with. And uh, I want to have a fudge factor in there 1.5. So I don't wanna be right up at uh, the max. And this is a uh, pay as you go subscription. And I do already have my licenses. So I'm gonna save that. Okay, next. What machines do I want to assess? And I've got a group of machines I already set up, all right, which are both of my machines. And create the assessment. All right, and so then it goes and it runs an assessment. Now I already have two assessments. I mean, come up, that one already came up, so it came up pretty quickly. Okay, um, so my initial assessment, I did this right away. And uh, as soon as I set everything up, as soon as I set up the appliance, and I didn't really have time to collect any performance data, all right? So I did this based on uh, what the actual physical settings were uh, in my virtual machines. So it says, okay, you, it found two virtual machines, one of which is ready, one of which is ready with conditions. Okay, and I can, go down into that and say, ah, okay, this pseudo OP Ubuntu has an unknown OS. It wasn't able to determine the OS, uh, it's, it's Ubuntu, uh, but, you know, it, which is actually fine, okay? um, it'll go through and that'll work fine. Now, uh, I have a performance-based assessment and uh, it's actually pretty, pretty comfortable with its cost estimates. Here's the monthly cost estimate, right, and it breaks it down um, in terms of compute and storage. And then uh, I can go in and, you know, and again, get more details and say, okay, here's pseudo OP windows. And if I drill down into that, it says, okay, it's going to recommend uh, that uh, I've got one, a one core machine, a standard D1 V2, because this machine was doing nothing over the last day. And you get the idea. Okay. So that is the assessment part. Then it will actually help with the migration as well. Okay, and migration is really, you can see I've got discover, setup replication, and migrate. So if I go to discover, okay, are your machines virtualized? Yes, okay, and then what this will do, prepare for replication by installing the replication provider. Now the replication provider in this case is actually different than the assessment provider. They're both agents, I have installed both of those. Okay, um, and then, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and replicate. Okay. So it says, okay, are these virtualized machines? Yes. Next. Uh, what migration settings? So this is okay. Uh, do I want to specify the hardware settings in Azure or do I want to go ahead and pull from an assessment? I'll pull from an assessment. I'll pull from the on-prem webinar and we'll do the uh, demo assessment that I just pulled. And it's, okay, what virtual machines do you want to include in this replication? I'm going to include this pseudo OP Ubuntu. Now, the Windows is not available because I already had that set up. Okay, so cool. Then I go target settings. Where do I want this thing to end up? Okay, I want this to end up in webinar target. Okay, it needs a storage account. And there's my storage account. I need webinar migrate. Virtual network, webinar target, VNet, all of those are set up in advance. And it doesn't actually matter that you don't have a Windows license because it's a Linux box. Then it's gonna say, okay, 
uh, how do you want to set this thing up? Okay, so what's the VM size it's going to go to? It says standard F2 S V2. OS type is Linux. My OS disk I'm going to leave and there's no availability set. I can change uh, the disk that I want to replicate, which is really just the one. And then I start replication. And that's it. So I just clicked through. And what this is doing is it's using the agents that are installed to actually replicate over the hard disk, the virtual hard disk, VHD or, or the, the you know, VMware equivalent, all right? Or it's using an agent to take all of the disk changes and replicate those over from a physical machine, all right? Now, of course, that could be a lot of replication, but uh, it is doing it for me and it is pretty simple. Now, I've already got one set up, okay? So I go over to migrate, I've already set up this pseudo OP windows. And what I can do here is I can migrate, okay? Now, that was actually not what I meant to do. It is now actually migrating that server. What I meant to do was go in here. Whoops. Uh, let's go in. Okay, where, oh, overview. That's what I meant to go to. There. That's showing my, my replication. Sorry, a little bit of a stumble on the demo there. Okay, this I want to show you. So it'll actually give me uh, full information on what's going on. So this is a machine. Now, again, this machine is hosted in uh, Hyper-V. Okay, now that Hyper-V happens to be in Azure, but that doesn't really matter. It's only in Azure because that was convenient for me, right? If it's on-prem, it'd be exactly the same process. And uh, what it's going to do hopefully here is come up. There we go. All right, and it's giving me uh, my information. So what it's telling me right now is that the planned failover was actually initiated. Okay, so it's actually going and setting this up uh, in my webinar target. Okay, so it's setting up all these things. So if I go to webinar target, all right, there isn't anything in here yet because it hasn't generated them. Okay, uh, but it will and it, it, it does relatively quickly. Now what I'm actually hoping is that it did not delete my test because I, earlier I did a test migration. So let's go, let's go to virtual machine and see if it's still there. Nope, it deleted it. Ha. So uh, I was gonna show you the fact and I'm gonna ask you to uh, take my, my word on this. And, and I knew this would happen because the last demo or the last webinar I like did six demos and they all worked perfectly and I bragged about it. So I knew that was gonna happen, but um, I'm going to ask you to take my word that what I meant to have over here, I meant to show you the test, is that you can do a test migration and it's going to migrate that server into a test area where you can, well, fully interact with it. And uh, that Windows server has a, um, it's, it's got IIS installed on it. So I was just going to go and connect up to IIS in the test environment that I accidentally deleted, but it is there. Okay. So. That is the demonstration. Now, it takes a little while for that, uh, the actual migration to finish. So I, I think even if I answer some questions, probably uh, not going to uh, uh, be enough time for this to finish, but we'll, we'll check it out. See, it started and I hadn't started creating it yet. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, that's pretty much it. So we covered, uh, you know, the design concepts, things you want to think about when you are actually moving over a workload, uh, networking being a critical component, cost being a critical component, um, and uh, also considering things like downtime and training. Uh, we looked at tools that you can use uh, that will help you migrate, uh, not only the migration process, but also the discovery and assessment process and how you can use those together. And I demonstrated a number of the tools, including cost tools, uh, that are at your avail. So uh, that's pretty much it with what I wanted to show you. Other than that, I do have um, one question here. And uh, the question, there we go, it started the migration process. Um, all right, a uh, couple of questions. First of all, the dependencies, I, I did answer that one. There uh, are tools I like to use, like I said, uh, take a look at the tools that are available directly in the Azure uh, migration project. 
Um, the next one, Tracy, what KPIs can I establish and what would you suggest them to be uh, to measure and help assess what to migrate from OP to cloud from a generic and technical standpoint, not focused on any particular business? Also, what could possibly help me to decide what sort of model should I adopt, IAAS, PAAS, or uh, SAS? Okay, so uh, my recommendation there is what you need to do is come into INE training, uh, get a cloud pass, and go through all of the Azure uh, architect material, and I think you'll get what you need. Now, I, I mean, truly, I, I, I would like you to do that, but um, that's a little bit of a shill there, so we won't quite go there. Um, here's, here's what I would say, again, and, and that, that's a really tough question to answer in a broad way, but I'll do my best, right? So for me, uh, the KPIs, the absolute number one KPI is total cost of ownership, right? Um, and, you know, I went through the TCO calculator fairly quickly, uh, and, and I, I went with kind of their best case uh, options, but there are a lot of options you can go in there, and so that is a tool that I think is very useful. Um, and, and for me, at the end of the day, regardless of what your business is, uh, that is the most important uh, KPI. Now, there are other things. Um, flexibility, and that's not really the exact word I'm looking for. Uh, there's a word and it escapes me at the moment, sorry. Uh, but your ability to uh, adapt quickly to changes, right? Uh, you know, let's say that you need to uh, spin up a virtual machine, you've got to have a service running, or you need a service, you don't want a virtual machine. You know, I can from uh, a free tool from Visual Studio Code, which I use all the time, uh, I can take an API that I have, and I can deploy that directly into Azure, right? With, with no having to worry about going and provisioning a, a virtual machine, looking at the space we have, interacting with Hyper-V or interacting with VMware, right? And so I have that ability to very quickly uh, respond to needs. Now, uh, obviously there's some caveats to that, but I think, you know, it, I, very broadly speaking, I don't think you could use this directly, but time to market, right? What is the overall time and cost to go from a developer's machine to go safely to a production machine, right? Now, you have lots of things like DevOps that are designed to flow through that, which, by the way, tie in very nicely to cloud systems like Azure, okay? Um, but I would say uh, that would be the second, I mean, you want to talk big picture KPIs, uh, those would be the two. Elasticity is a great uh, KPI. It wasn't the word I was looking for, um, but uh, that was put in the comment there. Thank you, Felipe. Um, elasticity is another one. Now, I'll make the argument that elasticity should be tied to cost. And in, in, in the end, everything gets tied to cost, right? Um, and so, for example, there's lots of private cloud solutions now, and VMware has great private cloud. There's other private cloud, Red Hat, uh, many other providers give you private cloud solutions. Azure has a private cloud solution, uh, Microsoft does with uh, Azure. So, uh, you know, you don't even necessarily need to move to the cloud, except for the fact that, you know, you have to physically provision the capacity, right? And so, you know, you can spend the money to provision the capacity to give you elasticity, all right, or you can let the cloud provider do that. And so, uh, really, it kind of all comes down to me uh, to um, really primarily cost, right? Uh, but uh, uh, your cost, uh, the speed to market, again, better term for that, uh, would probably be a secondary uh, KPI. So, there you go, two KPIs. All right, um, another question there. What's the state of IPv6 support? I see very few references to it. <laughs> um, it's there and it's there, but it's a little clunky and it's something that is improving. And uh, I, you have to look at this on kind of a case by case basis. For example, I'm gonna try and bring something up here. Azure public. IPv6. All right, public IPv6 address prefix overview. There you go, of IPv6 for Azure virtual networks. Usually it doesn't come up that quickly. Okay, and there's one other space here. All right, so this is telling you um, essentially, so I've got uh, IPv6 um, and IPv4 available at the 
uh, local level. Uh, I've got NSG IPv6 rules now. Okay. And by the way, I will tell you this, this particular picture is better uh, than it was six months ago. Okay. Um, load balancers now support IPv6. Uh, so do direct uh, public IP addresses. So if you want a snapshot, uh, this is probably the best snapshot you'll see right here of IPv6 support. And in fact, and I don't even need to go uh, to the other one. I'm going to give you that in the chat window. Let me pull up the chat window. There we go. That's Q&A. And I am having real struggles using my environment. That's right. I can tell you about architecture, but I can't use a chat window. All right, in the chat window, uh, I have put up there uh, the URL to this. And that really is pretty much the answer uh, to that question. Uh, great question. Okay. Uh, looks like the only one left, by the way, uh, thank you, Felipe, on the 200% agreement. Always good for that. Um, from Jerry, I've just started my cloud journey from networking and security background. Are there any workbooks out there for these? What is the best way for practicing and gaining hands-on experience? Okay. So, uh, this webinar is brought to you by i and &E. I and &E is a cloud training, or it's a training, uh, company, and we happen to have a cloud pass. And uh, on that cloud pass, we have uh, quite a bit of Azure and other cloud as well, but particularly a lot of Azure content. Uh, in fact, we currently have four complete learning paths uh, for Azure uh, that include uh, fundamentals. So if you're you know, new to the journey, uh, it's a great way to start up. Uh, we have an Azure admin learning path. We have an Azure architect learning path. And uh, we have a, an Azure security engineer learning path as well. So, uh, you know, honestly, yeah, there are other things out there. There's, there's free, you know, you can go and watch videos on uh, YouTube and things will be covered. Uh, but if I must say so myself, uh, hopefully, uh, I think I've done a pretty good job of uh, really kind of, you know, laying this information out. And uh, the Cloud Pass is, is pretty affordable. Okay. Uh, let's see, anything else? All right, that is it as far as the questions that I've got. If there's any other questions, I'll be happy uh, to answer them. Uh, otherwise, again, thank you so much uh, for being here. And by the way, if you like uh, i &E webinars next month, I've, I, I somehow roped our uh, our IT director into uh, doing a webinar with me. We're doing a, a hybrid cloud webinar where we're going to look at a workload that's spread across an on-prem environment, an AWS environment, and an Azure environment. Uh, that should be lots of fun. Lots of opportunities to see a crash and burn. Hopefully we won't do that. But again, thank you all very much for being here. Hope you had a good time. Hope you learned a little something. And uh, hopefully you'll come on over to i &E and check out what we have. And beyond that, I'm going to turn it over to the extraordinarily capable Brittany to finish us up. Thank you, Tracy. Um, once again, in case you popped on um, a little after we began, um, this webinar was being recorded. Um, if you are watching via Zoom, um, you will get a copy of the recording in a link um, sent to the email that you registered with. So um, that will come a little bit later on this afternoon. Usually it's around 3 or 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, but keep an eye out for that. And then also, um, if you haven't already, um, be sure to check out IE's webinar page on IE.com. Um, right now, you can access it. Um, there's a promo banner right at the top that's super easy to get to. Um, you can also find it down at the bottom of that page, um, the main page, under the resources. Um, so that's where we keep all of our webinars, um, keep all of our upcoming webinars, as well as the recordings uh, for past ones. Um, that's the best place to keep an eye out for upcoming webinars um, and also to just be able to easily access them. Um, so once again, um, that's INE.com. You can find it down at the bottom of the page in, under resources or right now there's a promo banner right at the top that you can access it um, and see any webinars you um, missed. Um, once again, thank you guys so much for attending and 
keep an eye out. Next week, we have a wonderful webinar um, with one of our networking instructors, Rohit Pardasani. Um, that will be at 10 a.m. next Tuesday. Um, and then you can find more information about that on that webinar page. Thank you guys so much and have a great day. Hey, one thing real quick. Sorry, I forgot to do this before. Um, if you want to reach out to me, I put my uh, contact information in the chat box. I know we're going to close this up pretty, pretty soon here. Uh, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll talk Brittany into sending that out. And, uh, you know, if, if you uh, follow me on uh, Twitter, uh, I get enough people to follow me. And uh, uh, Brittany has promised a, uh, a nice steak dinner for myself and my wife. Uh, no, actually, she didn't promise that. I'm just hoping that there was this look of panic on her face. But uh, I would love to, uh, you know, talk to you guys. Keep it up. I'm also on LinkedIn. So now, finally, I am done.